Warning, this video contains spoilers for Golden Sun. No single event laid the groundwork for the society and state of the worlds in the Red Rising series more so than the Conquering. The denotation of Earth's standard years is even labeled as PCE or post-Conquering Era. This event was foundational in the shift from the pre-color human society to the color hierarchy that we know from the events of the series. Beyond that, though, it holds a cultural vice grip upon the golds of the modern day, who are obsessed with their ancestors that participated in the Conquering. Among the most traditional and prestigious golds, being called an Iron Gold, in reference to the Conquerors, is an honor similar, and in some cases seemingly higher, than the formalized caste of the Peerless Scarred. While we wait for Lightbringer and Red God to come out, I find this to be the kind of analysis that helps keep me immersed in the world and ready for their releases. While I'm hoping this, and any of my videos, stay accurate and relevant past those releases, there is the possibility of retcons or simply elaboration in detail that could change or add to some of the information I've compiled here. I intend, at some point after the series is concluded, to create a full timeline leading up to 736 BCE, or the start of Red Rising, but I think a brief overview of human history leading up to 0 BCE is important for discussing the subject at hand. So, without further ado, let's get into the events leading up to the Conquering. The time period before Zero PCE is referred to by modern-day colored humans simply as the pre-conquering era, with no particular years assigned in reference to any notable dates. Human history seems to have progressed, as we the readers know it, up until a certain point, with brief allusions to huge but logical shifts in the state of world powers and in certain wars. In terms of world powers, there are mentions of an American Empire, Indian Empire, and an Empire of the Rising Sun, which almost certainly means Japan, but could likely be expanded to include other East Asian countries. While there is a possibility that the labels of empires are misnomers that have developed with time and historical revision by Golds, these seem to be mostly accurate as there is a specific mention of the last Indian Emperor and a distinction made of the United States of America as being America's pre-Empire status. Nira Alagustus mentions at one point that there grew to be 20 different factions with nuclear weapons. 20, each ruled by greed or zealotry. There is a terrifying real-world parallel with the fact that currently 9 countries in our modern day have no nuclear weapon stockpiles. Piercebound creates early events that are scarily possible, and none more so than the use of these weapons and the advent of World War III. Darrow references World War III in comparison to a mass flight of Martian patricians similar to how many fled to New Zealand after nukes were used and the continents brimmed with radioactivity. Mass use of nukes having irradiated much of Earth explains the present society fears and regulations limiting them to low yield for ship warfare, and yet makes it all the more interesting that Octavia Aulun, the one who ordered the burning of Rhea, remains in power as sovereign. We also know that one particularly irradiated place was England, and Luna even recruited the first Reds to send to Mars from the Irish Isles as their home became a wasteland when radiation seeped over. While this next idea is biased by Nero Augustus' own personal fears and goals, he mentions that the brightest minds of Earth were enslaved to an economy that demanded toys instead of space exploration or technologies that could revolutionize our race. They created robots, deutering the work ethic of mankind, creating generations of entitled locusts. This accurately describes issues found in modern consumerism, however I'd like to stray from getting too wrapped up in the ideas of Augustus, who is easily one of the most textbook fascists in the series. Somewhere alongside all these events, the colonization and expansion to Luna and its establishment as the port through which to colonize the solar system occurred. Because of Earth's heavy gravity and atmosphere, it was easier to launch spacecraft from Luna, and through economics it became the power of the solar system. Dancer of Farron once explained that, in space, every set of lungs must have a purpose, so the first colors were gradually instituted, and the reds were sent to Mars to gather the fuel for mankind. These first colors weren't heavily carved right away, and the first golds are referred to as having normal eyes and simply wearing gold uniforms. The process of golds becoming what they are today took generations of eugenics and biological tampering, what Dancer refers to as forced Darwinism. Despite Dancer, Given his personal interest in reading up on history, being one of the stronger sources for this type of information, it's from him that we end up with at least one major discrepancy. In 736 BCE, Dancer said that humans expanded to Luna 700 years ago, but even with the range of a rough estimation, this doesn't quite work. We have strong reason to believe that by the time of the Conquering, the Golds already had many of their considerable genetic differences. 
This is actually sourced from Pierce Brown himself on tour, where he describes his visualization of a seven-foot-tall gold strolling into the office of and decapitating the last Indian emperor. Given that, by Dancer's own wording, the golds took generations to develop to what they are, it seems most likely that he is simply off by a few hundred years here and went with the rough number of years from zero PCE in his reference to Luna's colonization. However, all this calculation and estimating can also just be hand-waved as an error on Pierce's part, as he has occasionally made slip-ups like this before, especially when it comes to years. As Luna grew more powerful, and the greed and oppression of Earth became more apparent, Luna was alienated from Earth. The wealthy of Luna realized that the taxation and ownership of Earth's countries and corporations wasn't something easily enforced, and they rebelled in what would become known as the Conquering. Most of what we know about The Conquering, as of Dark Ages release, unfortunately only comes from brief anecdotes. What little we do receive serves for fantastic world building and frequently connects to descendants of those conquerors that we are familiar with from the events of the series. While I'm sure I, and many others, are looking forward to more of these kinds of details in books 6 and 7, or in some sort of guidebook or story centered around this time, this is what we know right now. The Golds famously fell upon Earth in the first Iron Reign and the first gold to touch land in the reign that took the American eastern seaboard was Seneca Algrimus, progenitor of House Grimus. His spousal or familial relation, Vitalia Algrimus, is mentioned as a participant, having earned the title the Great Witch for reasons unknown to us. The reign was only launched after Scipio Al Bologna, presumably progenitor of the House Bologna, successfully broke through Earth's Atlantic fleet. An unnamed Augustan ancestor is credited with having decapitated the last Indian emperor, and the blood-stained rug remains in Archgovernor Augustus's office seven centuries later. The ancestors of Martian Golds are mentioned as having defeated the Britannic Armada above Earth's North Pole in space combat, and additionally having beaten the Fast Killers, presumably some type of ship of the Japanese Empire. Besides those already mentioned, some other houses who trace their blood back to the time of the Conquering are Houses Valii, Carthii, Falth, Votum, and Fabii. Of course, there are likely many others that could do this. For example, one would assume House Arcos is likely in this category, or the unnamed Houses of the Moon Lords. But these are the only houses, alongside Bologna, Grimace, and Augustus, who are expressly referenced by name in some way as being in this category. More important than any of these, though, is the Houses Loon and Ra. Selenius Aulun the Lightbringer, and Akari Al Ra were the founders of the society, creators of the Pax Solaris, and together are called the Scepter and the Sword. That last description has interesting implications for the roles of these men on whom we get so little detail. The Scepter in the modern day represents the rule of the Sovereign and House Loon, basically confirming that the Scepter refers to Selenius in that title. If we compare this relationship to that of Darrow and the Jackal in their alliance, who used the same terminology to describe themselves, simply put, the Scepter represents political power, and the Sword represents a warlord. This implies that Akari was the primary warlord of the Conquering, though this is purely conjecture on my part. Given that, in the words of Lornau Arcos, history is written by the victors, we end up with a very gold-centric perspective on history and the Conquering. The only two pre-colored humans on the side of Earth that are mentioned by name are Alfred Jones, the American general who went mad and lost his Imperium's dreaded mech division, as a cautionary tale, and more importantly, the famous Texan-American general John Merriwater. Despite Golds writing these histories, they don't hide the fact that the war was almost lost to this one man. Merriwater invaded Luna with his mech battalion, but ultimately failed and was defeated. His ship, the USS Davy Crockett, crashed into Luna's Atlas Mountains, and the ruins remain there to this day, serving as a sort of educational tourist site. Despite all their criticism of Earth and Greek other humans, the respect for John Merriwater as an enemy is present throughout many levels of the society. The final casualty count of the Conquering totaled 110 million, and while the Conquering ended in gold victory and paved the way for the society as we know it, there's more we can discuss in terms of both its immediate aftermath and long-term cultural impact. One of the first actions taken after the success of the Conquering is also one of the more horrifying events in the history of the society, a bloodless genocide of the remaining population on Earth. Having defeated Earth's militaries, the civilian populations still lived on the planet, and instead of massacring, imprisoning, or even converting them to the color hierarchy, they chose a brutal, yet efficient, and violence-free solution. 
The gold sprayed a chemical called solacine into Earth's troposphere, which neutered the entire population. It's hard to conceive of what the end of those people's lives was like. Imagine being one of the last children ever born, and watching over decades as the population declines, smaller and smaller groups of humans cluster together to wait out the end of their species, and being one of the last utterly lone people, the opportunity for legacy in life completely stripped away from you, as eugenically crafted superhumans wait above your head to take the land that belonged to you and your people for thousands of years. That isn't an idea that's explored in the series in depth, but I found it a particularly sobering image when I first read about it, and I believe it's worth mentioning to put things into perspective. The colonization of the solar system began before the conquering, and the Golds continued this process as they established the society. This kind of development varied in speed, and Mars, for example, took multiple centuries to stabilize. It seems that some of the moons of the Rim were colonized quite a bit faster, as soon after the conquering, Akari departed for the Rim. This was because of a famous falling out between him and Selenius, which Pierce Brown describes as them having gone from best friends to mortal enemies, but the reason for this is unknown. Some have theorized it was because of the bloodless genocide, but this is baseless, and the conflict could have come from any range of reasons. On the topic of Selenius, two and a half decades after the conquering, the first sovereign of the society penned his Meditations, a famous work respected by those both for and against the society. While the books in the series don't often include selections from in-universe texts, and Pierce more often uses quotes from modern-day characters or classical texts, we do actually end up with a selection from the Meditations at the beginning of Part 4 of Dark Age. It reads, The world is a maze without a center. Become it, or be forever lost. The final, relatively immediate aftermath of the Conquering was the death of the last pre-colored humans on Earth somewhere around a century later. This opened up the planet to being reseeded with colored humans, its territory divided up amongst gold houses such as Grimace and Falth, and assigned governors and an arch-governor for its rulership. Earth, sometimes referred to as Terra, developed its own distinct planetary culture, and Terrans became characterized by their fast accents, familiarity, and a reputation as talkers, with physical builds that are described as thicker, likely due to Earth's higher gravity. The memory of pre-color humans was far from wiped out of history, as golds remain infatuated with classical cultures and strongly incorporated them into all levels of their own. But the fundamental shift in humanity was drastic, and a societal upheaval unlike any we know in existing human history. Other than the entire modern society as we know it, there are two major cultural aspects of the Conquering's legacy. The first, and smaller of which, is the legacy of John Merriwater. While I call this legacy proportionally smaller, it still spans an entire color, as it is highly valued by the Grey cast. For seven centuries, Grey legionnaires have shouted the phrase, Merriwater ad portus, or Merriwater at the gates, as a reminder that the enemy is always at the gate. This kind of respect for an enemy is all the more impressive given the disdain for the final iteration of pre-color humanity generally held by the society. The legacy that permeates all levels of society is that of the conquerors themselves, the first iron golds, the noble champions of old. While the golds have a strong obsession with Greco-Roman culture and mythology, they are utterly enraptured by the conquering. It is considered an honor to trace your blood back to the conquering or to be called an iron gold. We see this myth of the conquerors believed widely in many cases, such as when Mickey the Violet said to Darrow, the golden ancestors, they call them iron golds, they were hard men. They stood lean and fierce upon their battle cruisers as they laid waste to the armories and republic fleets of Earth, what creatures they were. The Golds themselves have this so deeply ingrained that they make constant allusion to the hardness of iron as they connect it to this lineage. Darrow uses it to describe Sovereign Octavia Alun as hard, cold, a gold woman of iron and stone. And Nera Augustus describes slides down against him by saying, When the Sovereign pushed against me, I bent like gold should, with grace, with dignity. But now she cuts at me, and beneath the grace, beneath the aplomb, her knife will strike iron. The most talented young golds of Dara's generation are frequently referred to using this rhetoric as well. Cassius is described as tearing through the dueling circuit on Luna like an ancestor possessed, on his way to the position of Morning Knight, and Darrow, despite his rustic origins, is called an iron gold by his peers constantly, as he becomes more of a modern conqueror than any natural-born gold. This term is sometimes used negatively by those from comparably lower stations to the more traditional golds, such as Severo Arbarca, in order to describe someone as heartless or cutthroat. I find the duality of this term interesting, as the positive light for it is cast by those who see their genocidal ancestors as good, while those who use it negatively seem to comprehend the more accurate meaning. 
One of the greatest ironies is that the golds constantly take myths and feed them to the low colors to control them, like with the Veil for Reds or Norse mythology for Obsidians, but they themselves have totally swallowed the myth of the Conquerors and let it dictate their lives. As a reader, it's often easy to get caught up in the majesty of the golds and, naturally, the legend of their ancestors as well. But while they may see themselves as humanity perfected, I share Darrow's view of them as falling angels, evoking the image of Lucifer. One can't observe the conquering for all the glory and legacy it leaves behind without understanding that it's a testament to genocide and paved the way for centuries of slavery. Thank you very much for watching. This is the first essay style video where I've started reaching out into the broader universe of Red Rising rather than focusing on an individual character's profile. I'm planning to do a lot more with this, like diving into overviews of colors, technology, and planets, but I'm somewhat limited right now by the whole series not being out yet and leaving a lot of information subject to be revealed or changed. This does expand the type of videos I can be making a lot though, so I'd love to hear your suggestions for any kind of topic like this, or if you want to see a certain character profile soon. Any feedback or criticism is greatly appreciated, so please feel free to leave a comment, and I hope you enjoyed. <laughs>